who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin, my sin. and bear my shame, my shame. The, the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. There's nothing in this world that can take place that you don't present hope before us. We thank you for the promise of our hope in you. You are our hope and glory. Thank you for this time that we have together. 
Father, I ask a blessing on all those across our nation who are gathered this morning to lift praises to you. And I join in the prayers of so many that you will inhabit the praises of your people, that you are enthroned upon them. And Lord, I pray that you are blessed this morning by the lifting up of voices worldwide to honor and glorify you and exalt you over every nation, over every people. I ask a blessing over the offering and the tithe that we give today for the fullness of your kingdom come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, glory to God. Well, as you know, uh, due to the COVID-19 situation, again, we're not fasting offering plates uh, today. But we have those plates uh, in various places if you'd like to give an offering to the Lord today. Today we're going to be looking at, oops, somehow we're ahead here. don't know how that happened. Uh, get back to the beginning there, to the first slide. The Mystery of Lawlessness, Part 3. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings 3, 1 through 28. Now, for those who haven't been with us uh, in recent uh, Sundays, this is an extension of two earlier messages on the mystery of lawlessness. Those were June 7th and 14th, and we were exploring 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 17. Uh, it was a general response to what's happening in the United States right now, uh, which has continued to deteriorate in some ways, it was a recognition of the order of God, which is good, versus the order of Satan, which is evil. And we talked about the mystery of lawlessness and the man of lawlessness. Well, obviously, we're seeing a tremendous amount of lawlessness today in our nation. That passage of Scripture talked about uh, the end coming, but before the end would come, there would be the rebellion or the apostasy. Apostasy means the falling away from God, from his truth and his order. And uh, again, we're seeing a lot of that today as our nation has cut the uh, rope that had moored us to the Bible, to the scripture, the word of God, and to uh, Christian morals and values. So, of course, we're drifting toward lawlessness. So we see the falling away from, from God in our nation. We talked about how the lawless one would be revealed. Before the end comes, there would be tremendous deception and lies. Um, this would be prominent. Uh, there would be an offer of a new order of things. And the man of lawlessness would demand to be worshipped as God. We see the government, in many ways, taking that, that, that on for itself, declaring to us that our rights don't come from God, our Creator, as our founding documents say in our nation, but they come from government itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, worship us, serve us, you belong to us. We're hearing a lot of that from the government today. No need to go through due process or legislation, uh, just do what we say, right? You know, the governor of California has declared that people in California cannot worship by singing in church today. You can't sing in church today if you're in California by order of the governor. No infringement of religious liberty there, right? Uh, it's amazing the overreach that we're seeing in so many ways, all in the name of public health and safety. But don't be deceived. The man of lawlessness is being restrained for now, we're told by the Apostle Paul. That was 2,000 years ago. He's still being restrained, but the time will come and he will be released. What is restraining him? We talked about that. Well, 
I believe it is government. Romans 13, 1 through 10, just a portion of it on the screen, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Now, the Apostle Paul wasn't naive. He wasn't ignorant. Uh, he didn't think Rome was the perfect government <laughs> or that Rome was without fault. And yet, as we talked about before, so many things came together. It was in the fullness of time that Jesus was born to a woman born under the law to redeem us who were under the law. The fullness of time, all these conditions came together with the Roman, Romans in power, extensive system of roads, the Roman peace that was in place. They had tremendous tolerance for re different religious ideas as long as you'd accept their gods. They didn't understand the Jews. They only had one God. That was very strange. Uh, but they did keep law and order. And so you could travel throughout the empire, you could travel throughout most of the known world at that time in relative safety, and there was a common language. Koine Greek was the, was the language of commerce. Uh, pretty much everybody spoke at least some of that, and so you had a common language, and so the gospel spread throughout the empire very, very quickly for those reasons. God chose that moment in history to, to have his son born into the world because there was a government in place that had provided some order. Now again, not a perfect government. Has there ever been a perfect government on the earth? Will there ever be? No, no except when Jesus comes, right? So, um, so is there a time when you come against the government? Yes, we did, right? We just, this is Independence Day weekend, isn't it? July 4th, we declared our independence from Great Britain. Why? Because we felt that we were being abused by the king. And so they laid out all their grievances in the Declaration of Independence. They gave all their reasons for their own generation and all the generations to come. They said there comes a time when maybe you do need to disband uh, the political bands that have bound us to another. And they gave all the reasons for that, but they gave reasons based upon Scripture and the belief in what uh, God had declared for human beings. And this was an amazing experiment in human freedom, the United States. So we know that there is a future hope, but it is a future hope. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Right? And we could go on, but that time is not yet, is it? We're still waiting for the government to be upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Then it will be perfect government. But we ain't there, if you haven't noticed, right? So future hope that any government on the earth will be perfect, every government will be flawed because... We've all fallen short of the glory of God, haven't we? So we talked about some why politics matter. Well, politics is just about life. It's about how people live. It's about rules and regulations, laws. It's about the, the societal structure. Politics matter because Proverbs 14.34 reminds us righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Now, again, just a reminder, the righteous are not the perfect, right? There's been no perfect person on the face of the planet except for Jesus himself. So there can be righteous people, people who want to be rightly related to God, and honor him and fear him and serve him. But it doesn't mean they're perfect people. They make mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But we need people in authority who govern with God's order. This is what God wants. And when nations don't do that, God removes nations. You go back to human history. God lifts up some nations at one point. He also tears nations down. There's no, never been a guarantee the United States will last forever. Why, why, why should we? If we ever reach that point where we are simply not a righteous nation anymore, we don't serve the purposes of God, we deserve to be destroyed. And maybe God will raise up another nation. Right? This is the debate that's going on right now, isn't it? 
in our nation. That's, this is where we are with a nuance, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go. But if God's people who are salt and light are not involved in politics, then culture rots in the darkness, and there is what we're seeing, lawlessness. The people of God must be involved, especially in our nation. You know, we are far from perfect as a nation, but we do, we're in this amazing experiment of, uh, experiment of self-governance. There's never been anything like this on the, on the face of the planet before. We govern ourselves. This is a tremendously risky experiment. The founders knew that, and they knew that this could only exist, it could only last if it were a moral and upright people, meaning that people believed in the, what the Bible had to say. They believed in the principles of God because they knew any other people could not handle self-government. They knew that. They understood that. Again, they didn't expect the people to be perfect. They were not perfect. They didn't claim to be perfect. But we need to be involved. We have the right to go and vote. We have the right to go and have our voices heard. We elect people to represent us. We're a democratic republic. We're not a pure democracy for a reason, because the founders feared mob rule, which is what pure democracy turns into. They were very wise in what they did. This is an amazing place, an amazing place. There's no other nation like this on the face of the earth. Try expressing yourself in communist China in a protest with rioting and looting and watch what happens. Or any other communist nation, it will not be tolerated, you will disappear. And we've seen it over and over and over again. It's happening right now in Hong Kong, isn't it? So it's to be a deal. Hong Kong would remain free. Chinese, the communist government of China, they're not going to stick to that deal. You can already see it. People are being arrested even now, while we're here worshiping, they're being arrested in Hong Kong because they want to live as free people. There's so many people who don't appreciate what we have here, and it breaks my heart. It really does. Again, I don't think we're perfect. I have no, no illusions about that. But to hear some of the rhetoric about this nation just breaks my heart because we have an amazing nation. Not perfect, plenty of room for improvement. But go live somebody somewhere else if you don't like it here and see how quickly you're gonna wanna return. I've been to enough nations on the earth now to know I don't wanna live anywhere else except the United States. So, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? But believe me, if you've ever been to other nations, you don't want to stay there, all right? That's why most of the world is trying to get here now to the United States. So we don't understand really what we have in so many ways, uh, and it's, it's, it's a tragedy. Now, this is my opinion, okay? I'm entitled to my opinion just like you're entitled to yours, right? God loves people, so politics are important. Politics should be about the people God loves, and that is all people, right? Government is God's servant for our good, as we have seen already. Political actions which manipulate, exploit, or hurt are wrong. And we've had plenty of those in our history as the United States. They were wrong. They were wrong then. They're wrong if we do them now. And we shouldn't try to defend them. But we can also point out that they were wrong. But many of these things have been addressed in many ways. Again, not perfectly, but the nation has tried to address many of these past wrongs. The past, at some point, has to become and left in the past, doesn't it? Amen. I mean, it just does. That doesn't mean we don't acknowledge the, the horrors of the past, we don't acknowledge the abuses of the past, but at some point, it's past. Got to be. You can't keep it alive. Political actions which truly help people honor God. So if government does not consider itself accountable to God, 
And of course, if you have a government that has fallen away from God, and a people that have fallen away from God, the government's not going to consider itself accountable to God. The government dissolves into self-centered special interest groups, all fighting for king of the mountain. That's what happens. And we're beginning to see that happen now. Everyone suffers as wickedness is exalted because we have turned away from God. This nation, the United States, cannot exist if we ever cease to be a nation that honors God. It can't. It will fail. It will fall. And the founders predicted that. They understood that. They expected the Word of God, the Bible, to be the basis for training in the public schools throughout the United States history. They really did. We're not making any of this stuff up. <laughs> all right, go back and do your research. They expected the Bible to be the foundation of all public education. And they predicted if this ever stops, and they couldn't imagine it ever would, but if it ever stops, the nation will fall. They predicted this. Well, what have we been seeing? Since the 1960s, we took prayer out of the school, we took the Bible out of the school first, then we took prayer out of the school. All right? And what have we been reaping? It's not been good, has it? So, I don't need to tell you America is in crisis. Duh, right? That's kind of an understatement, isn't it? Well, yesterday was Independence Day, and instead of one nation under God celebrating this amazing country together, we are severely divided. By the way, do you know the Pledge of Allegiance doesn't say one nation under God? You know there's no comma there? Try saying it the right way and watch everybody look at you like you're a moron. It says one nation under God. Not one nation under God. One nation under God. This was the point. All right? So we're divided. Uh, we can't even enjoy sports anymore without being lectured. Basketball will now allow profane personal political messages on jerseys. The NFL just announced it will be playing two national anthems before games. Mom, did you know there were two national anthems? I didn't know that. Who legislated that? Who voted for that? Did Congress convene and say, hey, let's declare a second national anthem? No, it's just mob rule. Lift every voice and sing will be played first. That's the black national anthem, according to those in the know. And then they'll play the Star Spangled Banner. And I imagine there'll be a lot going on in terms of standing or kneeling, and I won't go beyond that. So bye-bye professional sports, in my opinion, and multi-million dollar players' contracts, because I don't want to watch it. It's all been politicized. Sports is supposed to be an escape. Can we just watch the sport and just enjoy a pastime and not have everything politicized? Everything. And all the politically correct stuff shoved down our throats every time we turn on a game. Can we, can we just not do that, please? So let's look at 1 Kings 3, 1 through 28. Because right now we need the wisdom of Solomon 1 Kings 3, 1 through 28. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And I've just got a portion of it here. I've got another slide, too, and I'll try to track where I am and get the right slide up at the right time. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. Not good. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings upon that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. 
Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, so the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king sh shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Then two harlots came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Oh, my Lord, this woman, and I, and I dwell in the same house, and I, I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I was delivered, this woman also gave birth, and we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while, while your maidservant slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, it was dead. But when I looked at it closely in the morning, behold, I, it was not the child that I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living child is mine. And the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, oh my Lord, give her the living child and by no means slay it. But the other said, it shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman and by no means slay it. She is its mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered. And they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to render justice. Welcome to the minefield. Welcome to my job. As one who carries the name of Jesus, I don't ask how high when bullies tell me to jump. And I don't think any Christian or any American should. And there's a lot of bullying going on right now. A lot of intimidation. A lot of manipulation. And we're being told to jump. And they expect us to ask, how high? I'll do it. I hate being manipulated and controlled. I cannot stand it. And I'm stubborn. Just ask my wife. No, don't ask my wife. Okay. Bad choice, bad choice of things to say. All right, so today, you don't just get into trouble for what you do say, right? You also get into trouble for what you don't say. You must say it correctly right now or we will send you to the Kula, right? 
a cooler for you. I mean, this is true, isn't it? You have to, to say it correctly right now. And if you don't say it now, you're in trouble. You have to say the right thing right now. What everybody else is saying, you have to say it right now. You have to say the politically correct thing right now. See, if you don't jump quickly enough or high enough, you risk being labeled a racist so you can be demonized, disrespected, discounted, and silenced. You are not entitled to another opinion. You have to agree. This is fascism. Such an irony, the people who claim to be the tolerant left are the most intolerant people in the nation. This is fascism. We say jump, you say how high. And if you don't say how high, we will destroy you. We will take away your business. We'll take away your ability to work. We'll take away your freedom. We will crush you. This is what happens. It's what happened in Nazi Germany. Nazi party, by the way, was a national... Socialist Party of Germany. It's what happened in China under Chairman Mao. It's what happened in Venezuela. It's what happens every place socialism is implemented. Every place. The nations are destroyed, the people suffer. And everybody is forced into submission. Hitler had his brown shirts, the young idealistic youth who wore brown and they would go out and bully people, which is submission. Mussolini had his black shirts. Think about Antifa right now. Same idea. Chairman Mao had the Red Guard. We will intimidate you into cooperating because the left is violent and people start to walk in fear. This is how the left does what it does. So, Having already lost a couple of toes in the minefield, I'm going to stomp through the minefield again today. And you're welcome to join me if you'd like. And we'll see if anything explodes or not. I, I don't know. I can't even predict what's going to explode anymore. It's amazing. All right, so let's talk about the harlots who came to King Solomon. Which harlot, which woman standing before Solomon did not love the live child? Which one? Pretty obvious answer, right? The one willing to see the child cut in half. That woman did not love that child. The wisdom of Solomon became very clear, didn't it? Let me ask you this. Which side in America today does not love America? I don't think this is a hard answer. Clearly, it's the one willing to divide America. Indeed, the one which insists America must die so as to be replaced. Because America, as we know her, was never good and so is to be hated. Now, this is the narrative. Don't, don't be snookered by trying to nice, you know, nicey nice this thing up. This is the narrative. Because of slavery, and because the founders, many of them had slaves, owned slaves, America has never been good. It is fatally flawed from the beginning, and it needs to be torn down and replaced. That's why they started out with tearing down Confederate statues, and then they went beyond that. Now they're tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president. He was the abolitionist president. But the mob is out of control. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know who these people are. So it's, it's really amazing. There's a young woman from Venezuela who's warning us, I lived through this. First they come for the statues, then they come for the people. You're next. She's telling us, look, this is what's happening in your country. Don't let this happen. It's mob rule. They are here to destroy you. This is what this is all about. Look, I'm trying to be just as fair as I know how to be. 
I highly value truth. I don't just get up here and speak drivel. I can back up what I say when I speak from the pulpit because it's important to me. This is what's going on. And they don't make any secret out of it. See, this, this is the point, right? They're very open about what they're doing. And we need to understand it. Now, it gets, it, it gets derailed somewhat and sort of covered up by this issue, which we're going to talk more about. But at its heart, it is about replacing America. Have you heard about the 1619 Project? New York Times instituting this 1619 Project says all of the United States history began in 1619. Why 1619, you ask? Good question. Why 1619? I thought Jamestown was established in 1607. Well, 1619 was when the first African slaves were brought to the shores of this nation. And so the history of the United States began in 1619 because it began with slavery. So they want to change American history and say that American history began with slavery. That was the very beginning of the United States history. Now, clearly, this is just not factual, right? But there are Ivy League universities that have already adopted this into their curriculum. They're going to be teaching this to our university students. And it's going to filter down through the high school, middle schools, elementary schools, just like a lot of other things have filtered down through the decades past in my lifetime that I have witnessed with my own eyes. You know, decades ago, the LGBTQ movement, it wasn't called that at that point, declared, one of the leaders of that movement said, we are going to get you through your children. We are going to get this nation through your children. And that's been their agenda. And it's long term, and they're determined, and they've done it. So now, kindergartners are being taught all kinds of aberrations as normative. They know what they're doing, and they're good at it. This is just fact, folks. It's not, I'm really not trying to be inflammatory. I really am not. But somebody's got to speak the truth. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who can do that, but, but we need to speak the truth. People are lying to us. They are deceiving, trying to deceive us. All right, so it's clear as to which mother, which of the hardest to love the live child, it's clear which side today loves America. Now, again, they may say, oh, well, we love America. We just want to totally replace America <laughs> and make it something entirely different than how it was founded. Well, okay, I, I, I'm going to quibble here a little bit. I don't think that means you love America. You clearly don't love the United States of America because you want to completely destroy it and start over, right? I mean, this is just fact, <coughs> all right? So... We have to decide. See, some think America deserves to die. Some think America deserves to live. This is where we are. It just is. This, this is where we are now. We have, to, we have to decide. What decision will we make? See, maybe, for the sake of argument, maybe America does deserve to die. Maybe because it has been evil from its inception, we deserve to die. Now, I don't share that opinion, as you know. But it's one of the options, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a perspective. And so, in the sense that it's somebody else's perspective, it's valid in that sense. That's their perspective. All right? Then you've got people on the other side who say, well, no, I, I don't agree with that. And my perspective which is one that disagrees with that other one, is also valid, right? But there are many people trying to shout me down right now and say, no, you're just an evil, white, old, you know, guy, and you're a racist because you're, you were born white. And it's just systemic, and you can't help it. And so your opinion doesn't matter. I heard a man the other day who has a British accent. He's actually from Indian extraction. His, his parents were Indian. And then he, they moved to England, and he, he was born in England. Now he's in the United States, and he, he said they were, he was at dinner with friends the other day, and some people came along with Black Lives Matter, and they were confronted, and, they, and, he, and he stood up and he said, um, well, let me ask you a question. Does my life matter? 
It's so interesting because he said the black people who were there said, yes, your life matters, and we'd like to have a conversation about this. It was the young white women who were there that said, no, your life doesn't matter because you're white. He said, well, first of all, I'm not white. <laughs> okay, he looked, he looked white, you know, whatever that means. But he's like, I'm, you know, I'm Indian. I mean, I'm not Caucasian, or I'm not white. But, but it's shocking, isn't it? No, your life doesn't matter because you're white. Um, hello? This is why this is so repugnant to me. Speaking of bullying, do you know that Walmart has now agreed they will not sell All Lives Matter t-shirts anymore? They will continue to sell Black Lives Matter t-shirts, but they won't sell All Lives Matter t-shirts anymore. Why? Because they've been bullied. Corporations are giving millions of dollars, capitalistic corporations are giving millions of dollars to the Black Lives Matter organization, which is a Marxist organization. Now, I'm going to talk more about that. Don't, don't get all upset with me right now, okay? Don't blow my other foot off. I'm going to back up what I'm saying here. There's a difference between the organization and a lot of people who are protesting right now. I'm going to talk about the organization, all right? Officially, this is who the organization leadership is. They are Marxists. They want to tear down the entire capitalistic system. And American capitalists, because they've been bullied into saying the politically right thing, are giving them millions of dollars to tear down their companies. I mean, how stupid can we be? It, it, it's really kind of remarkable, isn't it? That's the power of bullying, which is why I hate bullying so much. All right, so again, maybe America does deserve to die. All right, that, that's a perspective, and that's a perspective being loudly shouted right now. And we need to talk about it. We need to decide, all right? We cannot exist for long tearing each other apart. We've got to decide as a people, and we need to decide very, very soon, all right? We cannot exist for long tearing at each other. Abraham Lincoln quoted Jesus on this when our nation was terribly divided at the Civil War. A house divided against itself cannot stand. By the way, how long, I, 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 I predict, this is not a prophetic word, I predict that you will hear that the Apostle Paul was racist. I predict that you will even hear that Jesus himself was racist. Why? Because Jesus never condemned slavery. Never. In fact, he told lots of parables about slaves. He, he healed the centurion's slave, servant, he didn't say, you bad centurion, you have a slave. The Apostle Paul actually told slaves to be obedient to their masters and to serve them well. He also told masters to be kind to their slaves. It was life at that time. But because Paul didn't say the politically correct thing, condemning slavery, I predict you're going to hear how racist the New Testament is. Now, it's true, Southern theologians, right, in the Democratic South, before the Civil War, used the Bible to justify slavery. They quoted these verses, obey your masters, slaves obey your masters. All right? But see, the scripture is put into, into, into effect the love of Christ, which sets people free, and these distinctions begin to disappear. It prepared the way for the abolition of slavery. And the United States, at its founding, even though, yes, there were slaves, and we talked about this before, and I'm going to talk more about it in some more detail next Sunday, hit a political compromise and allowed slavery to continue, even though many of the founders were conflicted at that point. But in order to form the union, they had to make, they had to strike a deal at that point. And they allowed slavery to stand for now, but they also understood that if America stood on the principles of the gospel, slavery would eventually disappear. They laid the foundation for it in the founding documents we believe it is self-evident. Any idiot should understand this, in other words, to use less Jeffersonian terminology, <laughs> that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's right in the beginning of our, the founding of our country. 
we understand this, we proclaim this under God, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator, not by the government, by God himself. They're endowed with fundamental rights, every human being. But it was a compromise in the actual working this out. You know, there's, a, there's a saying about laws and sausage, right? If you like sausage and you like laws, you probably don't want to watch either one of them being made. All right? So, and that's what we had at the founding of the, of the nation. There were some things that, that we consider abhorrent today. How could they allow slavery to stand? Well, if they hadn't struck that compromise at that point because of the way the economies worked in the North and the South and so forth, there would be no United States of America. There would be no nation that has now abolished slavery. But we're judging people, the, the politically correct of today, the mob, is judging people based on modern sensibilities. They're going back centuries and they're judging people based on the values of today and they're declaring those people who live in a very different time and culture are evil. And they were evil and we shouldn't have, I don't even want to look at a statue of those people and, and let's just erase their memory. You know, excuse me, but if the Democrat Party, if the, if the cancel culture movement was, had integrity, let me put it this way, if they had real integrity, what would have to be abolished? Instantly. The Democratic Party. Wouldn't it? I mean, who, who do you think these statues are, these Confederates? They're all Democrats. Again, I'm not trying to be inflammatory. I'm just pointing out the inconsistencies here. The Democrat Party was formed to keep slavery in place. And I could go through the entire history of the Democrat Party. You don't want me to do that today, and I don't want to do it today. But I'm telling you, if you're going to have integrity and you're canceling culture, the Democrat Party should vote to dissolve itself today. Right? If you're going to pull down the statues, then dissolve the party. Because you're the ones who, who fought against the Civil Rights Act. You're the ones who, who defended slavery, fought a bloody war to keep it in place. You're the ones who fought Reconstruction. You're the ones who established the KKK. You're the ones who segregated the schools and fought desegregation. You're the ones. You know, the Civil Rights Act in 1965 only passed because the Republicans voted for it, and most of the Republicans voted for it. Most of the Democrats fought it. And Robert Byrd, bless his little KKK heart, in West Virginia, Senator Robert Byrd stood up and gave the longest filibuster in Senate history tr to block the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Good Democrat from West Virginia. And he established the KKK in West Virginia. It wasn't there before him. We, we don't hear any of this, do we, in our history? It doesn't fit the narrative. But it's, everything I just told you is absolutely true. All right, so we cannot stand if we are divided. Remaining neutral is not an option. The sword is in the king's hands right now. Alive or dead? Which way, America? That's where we are. That's where we are. For years, there's been a prediction of a second civil war. We've been fighting a cold civil war for quite a long time. And we may very soon have a hot civil war on our hands. I don't know. I hope it doesn't come to that. I really do. But we are so hopelessly divided on this. And people are absolutely convinced of their own viewpoints. And I understand that. I'm convinced of my viewpoint. I get it. Right? But we've got to be able to talk to each other and actually deal with real history, not a, a remanufactured history. And that's what we're being taught in our schools now. And that's why our children have been indoctrinated by our schools to believe a false version of American history. That's what they're taught. That's what they've been taught by their professors. And so they're passionate about this, but they haven't been given the full truth. And I believe Christians should value truth, the full truth truth. So, which harlot should get the child? All right? Both women were described this way, by the way. Okay? It's not a judgment. <laughs> not my judgment on either one of their characters. All right? Both women are described as harlots. Take it up with God. All right? So, what does King Solomon do? Well, first he determines which harlot loved the child. 
One harlot was willing to kill the child rather than to see the other woman happy with her own child. So once the harlot who loves the child is identified, what does Solomon do? He calls social services to take the child away from the harlot, who's obviously not a fit mother, right? Is that what he did? No. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman. Whom Sol Solomon knows this is a harlot, a prostitute. Give the living child to the first woman and by no means slay it. She is its mother. Solomon gave the child to the mother who loved it. He didn't judge her fitness. He didn't say, you know, you're not morally pure. You have a checkered past, to say the least. You're not going to get this child. I'm going to call social services. I'm going to take that child away, put it in a foster home. He didn't do that. And he knew she was not without sin. He said, give the child to the mother who loves it. That was the wisdom of God. So what about America? Who's going to get this child? Is America worth saving? We need to start there. Can the imperfect mother, the American people, who birth this child and love her be entrusted with this child into the future? Now, the mother is flawed. She's like that harlot. But she loves the child. Or should we just kill this child and birth another? But I've got a question for you. Can we trust any quote unquote mother willing to kill this child with any child in the future? I would say no. But isn't this where we are right now? I shared some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s wonderful speech, I Have a Dream, spoken from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963. There's a plaque marking that spot there. It's ironic, isn't it, that he chose that spot to speak this very famous, inspiring speech, and now they want to tear down the Jefferson Memorial because Jefferson was a slave owner. And if you go in there and look at what's inscribed, there's a quote there from Jefferson. He says, I tremble for my country when I remember that God is just. Jefferson himself was conflicted about this whole issue of slavery, but he was a man of his day, and he had tremendous debt because he loved to spend money. And he found himself caught in his own circuit. I'm not trying to defend the man. I'm just saying, here's where he was. But he understood. I, I, I tremble for my country when I remember that God is just. And he knew that judgment was coming one day. He knew it. It's right there around the rotunda of the memorial. And later, if you look at the Lincoln Memorial, which has also been defaced, by the way, again, go figure that one out. The second inaugural address, and he talks about the whole institution of slavery and what happened, the Civil War being a judgment on the nation because of slavery. That's how Lincoln saw it. So it's just so amazing to me. So here's Martin Luther King, and he says, I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream, and I'm not even going to try to, uh, to match his oratory. Uh, it is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is our hope. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Now, I don't hear the vitriol in his voice that you're hearing today toward America. Flawed nation, yes, he had a dream that it could be great if it lived out its own creed. And some will say, well, it hasn't, so you need to destroy it now. Martin Luther King was a dreamer. Even during his lifetime, there are already factions in the civil rights movement who were saying we need to be more violent in order to get attention and, and get something done. And he said, no, we're not going to do that. 
But notice all of God's children will be able to sing. Not just black, not just white, not just Asian, all. The American dream is a wonderful dream. And like many dreams, you don't always realize it fully. But I challenge you to find anything else on the face of the earth that is anywhere near it in grandeur and respect for human life and dignity. We'll talk more about next time about the compromises made even in the Constitution about representation by population. We'll talk more about that. Again, compromises were made. Does that mean that the entire system just has to be destroyed? I would say no. Many people would say yes. So should this child live? Well, I believe Martin Luther King understood this child and perfect at its founding due to slavery and deeply flawed for a hundred years after the slaves were freed, could be truly great if we would grow to match the words spoken at our birth. And that takes time, it takes effort, and it takes will. The Black Lives Matter, the leadership, and it's very important we separate the leadership from people who are just upset about things and want to protest. And they want to hear their, how their grievances heard. Black Lives Matter leadership believes America was irredeemably flawed at her birth and does not deserve to live. Now note the word, key word here is irredeemably. Let me repeat it. Black Lives Matter believes, leadership believes America was irredeemably flawed at its birth. Irredeemably. Cannot be salvaged. Does not deserve to live. So Black Lives Matter, the leadership, again, let's be careful here, the leadership is not seeking reconciliation. Black Lives Matter leadership is not seeking relationship which loves and forbears despite differences. Black Lives Matter leadership is not seeking redemption because we are irredeemably flawed. No redemption. These are Christian virtues. Black Lives Matter is not seeking any one of these things. Black Lives Matters, Matter is seeking destruction and replacement. According to themselves. Okay, I, again, I'm, I'm not making this up. I mean, I'm not just manufacturing this. All right, so we've got to separate out the sentiment Black Lives Matter from the organization. And I'm going to try to do that, okay? Black Lives Matter, yes, of course. Very few Americans would disagree. And in fact, would affirm black lives and all lives are extremely important and valuable. This is certainly true of Christian Americans. Don't we believe that every life is precious before God? But you can't even say that now without being bullied, right? That's why Walmart says we're not going to sell All Lives Matter t-shirts. Because somehow you're disrespecting the Black Lives Matter movement by saying we believe all lives matter. We, we agree with you, Black Lives Matter. Because we believe all lives matter, uh, aren't they kind of, you know, don't they go together? No, you can't say that. Again, bullying is what's happening here. Many Black Lives Matter protesters simply and generally want to draw attention to their grievances. They want and they deserve to be heard. We have to have this conversation as a nation. We've got to address these things. We can't just sweep it under the rug and say, oh, it doesn't matter, didn't, didn't happen. Yes, let's talk about it. Our nation acknowledges peaceful assembly and free speech. Peaceful assembly and free speech, including that, we do, that speech we do not agree with as fundamental rights. But the left doesn't value free speech. Try uh, having a conservative speaker scheduled to speak on a college campus these days. The students are going to practically riot. You can't bring that conservative speaker here, that Christian speaker here, because that's hate speech. And they'll actually tell you with a straight face that the Constitution does not guarantee freedom of speech if it's hate speech. I've got news for you all. Freedom of speech is freedom of speech, whether you like it or not. It used to be an Americanism to say, I don't agree with what you're saying, 
but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Not anymore. Not with the younger generation anyway. If you don't speak the right thing, you're not protected by the First Amendment. You don't have a right to say that because we disagree with you. I don't know any Americans who would say the institution of slavery was not a terrible blight on this nation. I think Americans generally, generally, are fair-minded, good people. Now, maybe I'm just hopelessly naive, all right? But I, in my experience, most Americans are fair-minded. All right, now let's talk about the organization versus the sentiment. Again, very important we separate these things out. Now, this is the leadership. One of the three founders acknowledged on video, two of them are trained Marxists. That's how she described herself. And the other one, this leader in New York City recently stated, if we do not get what we want, we are going to burn the system down. That's pretty clear, don't you think? Okay. Their own published statements make their political and moral values clear. Read them. They are not Christian, and they make no claim to be, all right? So that's, that's not a moral judgment on them. It's just a fact. They're not Christian, okay? They, they don't claim to be Christian. But let's, let's be clear about this, all right? Um, if you go to their website, by the way, they do a good job of trying to clean all this stuff and make it look very nice. Just to dig a little bit deeper, find their actual statements of their policies and their purpose, and read them, all right? Even on their website, they claim to be a target, prime target of disinformation. Wow. Okay. And there probably is a lot of disinformation about them, to be fair. All right? But there's also truth about them. And I'm telling you that truth right now. All right? So read what they actually say about themselves. The leadership, again. They are anti-Semitic. Go figure that one out. They recently come out with a statement condemning Israel. Now, what does this have to do with Black Lives Matter? I, I, I don't know. This is the point. They're a political organization. All right? Somehow they tied it to the Israelis trained some of our police. I don't know. But anyway, they're anti-Israel. They're anti-Semitic, so they are prejudiced against a certain ethnic group. But you want to complain that black lives are not being respected while you disrespect Jewish lives. It's, it's, it's kind of remarkable, isn't it? As Marxists, again, self-proclaimed, they reject God and religious values and devalue individual lives. Just what Marxists do. As Marxists, they are trained to divide people through civil unrest, pitting group against group in order to overthrow the system and introduce Marxism, socialism, and communism. That's what they are trained to do and committed to do. The leadership was clearly poised to immediately politicize the death of George Floyd, which all Americans were horrified by. The point is they were poised, ready to go. They were just looking for that spark they needed to light the fuse. They condone violence, they cooperate with Antifa and other anarchist groups, and they call for the death of police. Y'all remember the banner, Black Lives Matter, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. Now, they haven't said that recently, to be fair. But it's hard to divorce that from our memories, isn't it? Which is why I don't understand why Christians don't understand that when they post things in agreement with Black Lives Matter, it's being associated with all of this other stuff. We need to be wise about what we post. So if Black Lives Matter, why is Black Lives Matter, the organization, silent about Margaret Sanger's eugenics, which created Planned Parenthood to resolve the Negro problem, as she called it, by killing black babies and other undesirables, and kills 40% of black babies every year nationwide. If Black Lives Matter, why is Black Lives Matter organization silent about the weekly slaughter of black people in Chicago and other city centers? run by Democrat politicians for decades, including little children. If black lives matter, then why are they silent about a 19-year-old black man recently killed and the other black teenager shot in the peaceful 
CHOP zone, that autonomous zone in Seattle. If Black Lives Matter, why are they silent about black police officers murdered while sitting in their cars? If Black Lives Matter, why are they silent about due process and assumption of innocence until proven guilty? Prominent civil rights attorney recently observed, black civil rights attorney, I have been suing police departments for 25 years for abuses, but all Black Lives Matter does is play the race card and ignore black on black crime. It seems to me Black Lives Matter, to Black Lives Matter, the organization only when the death of a black person can be used politically to further their narrative that the police who represent the system that needs to be torn down are racist and thus the whole system must be torn down and replaced. This is a political organization. So without America, what? I don't know anyone who says America doesn't have its flaws. Americans agree slavery was evil, that mistreatment of any person regardless of color is wrong. We agree we should correct wrongs. There have been many public ceremonies of repentance by Christians asking for forgiveness for slavery and racism. Maybe not enough, but there have been many. Is there any perfect people or sinless nation on earth? No, because human nature works against it. If this child is put to the sword, what will replace it? Marxism's solution is always to tear down the present system, but its promise of utopia to follow always goes unfulfilled. Marxism, the, ide the ideological underpinning for socialism and communism, has produced more human misery and death than any other system in the history of the world. It's not even close, folks. Mao Zedong killed 100 million Chinese. Stalin killed 40 million Russians. Hitler killed 11 million Jews and Christians. It's not even close. This is just truth. It always results in misery for human beings. Did we learn nothing from the 20th century, the bloodiest century in human history? Just coincidental that it followed Marx, isn't it? So where from here, as we conclude, where sin is involved, repentance and forgiveness bring resolution, reconciliation, and relationship. So next Sunday, how is repentance on behalf of a nation expressed? And what about forgiveness? So we'll be looking at next Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We acknowledge we are living in difficult times and not, not one of us has the wisdom to fully understand all of this and to provide every solution. So we, we approach this with humility, with some fear and trembling. We understand emotions are running high right now. I just pray, Lord, that you would help every American do our best to be fair-minded, to try to truly listen, to hear the grievances, to, to, to try to truly understand the perspective, which may be very, very different from our own, based on human circumstances and experience, personal experiences that people have had. But I pray, Lord, for, for an, un an uncovering of truth in all of this, where there has been tremendous deception, a lot of things covered over, a lot of things manufactured. Lord, we are at a crisis point in our nation, as you know, and we need wisdom. Help us to decide about this child, America. Does this child deserve to live? And if so, how do we move forward? If this child does not deserve to live, then we decide just to cut it in half and start over. then who in the world has the wisdom to 
put something in place better than what we have in the United States of America with all of our problems, with all of our challenges, with all of our weakness, with all of our sin. Lord, we need direction. We need guidance. We need your help. We need a great awakening as people turn back to you. Without that, this nation will fall. And Lord, if it's your timing for us, then we accept that. But just show us how you want us to proceed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so God bless you for bearing with me and tromping through the minefield with me. I hope too many people didn't get uh, the finish just blown off during that little excursion. Um, we have someone who had expressed an interest in coming forward and being introduced. You still want to do that? So we're going to call all the way from the very back. Come on up, Catherine. <laughs> Yeah, especially after that sermon, right? Yeah. Okay. No so, you heard her. She didn't have any problem with what was just said. Just want to make that clear. Okay. So, this is my sister, Catherine. And Catherine is here, and uh, she would like to join with us, our congregation, Amen. become a part of our congregation. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're going to vote on you later. Oh. Don't, oh. don't relax too much yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, but uh, formally, we will vote at the, at the uh, next uh, ministry business meeting. Okay. That's, that's when all goes into the official record, right? But you know everybody's enthusiastic about you being here. We all love you. So Catherine's coming by a statement of Christian experience to join with us in membership. And so uh, we rejoice with her. So Catherine, may I pray for you? Yes. Catherine, I thank you. Uh, Lord, I thank you for Catherine, my sister. And I ask that you would just uh, continue to strengthen her. I thank you for her heart for you, her love for you. Um, thank you, Lord, that we are one mm -hmm. in Christ. Thank you. Uh, she's got more melanin in her skin than I have, but we're one mm -hmm. in Christ. We're brother and sister, and we are so grateful for the diversity in the body of Christ. Lord, there's so many things that divide us right now in terms of race, creed, color, age. Very different perspectives based on age right now in our country. But these things don't separate us when we are in Christ. So thank you for that. So Lord, I bless my sister in your holy name. I thank you for her. We receive her, Lord, gladly. And of course, we'll make that official uh, later on at our business meeting. But thank you, Lord. We give you honor and glory and all praise. Amen. Amen. So please make yourself known to Catherine. If you don't know her. So anybody planning to vote against her, let her know right now, okay? So she'll have to, she can quit worrying about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't you worry, oh, you're gonna, oh, you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> Nobody's going to vote against you. <laughs> yeah, we're done. Okay. You, can, you can go back there if you hide back in the corner again if you want. <laughs> but uh, please speak with Kath and let her know how glad you are that she's joining with us. So if you'd like to receive prayer today, you're welcome to remain, and we'll pray for you. So go in peace, the love and serve the Lord. Uh, try to stay out of trouble as much as possible this coming week. But stand for the truth. Love people in the name of Christ. But don't let yourself be bullied, okay? Love people in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.